Hi there, and welcome to another interview. Today, I've got the fabulous Casey from Boundless Body. Hi, Casey. Hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine, actually. You thought I was going to get the question straight in, but here we go. So uh, why did you become carnivore? Oh, well, that's a very big loaded question. So it was actually 16 years ago yesterday that I became a personal trainer. Um, my very first day, which was fantastic. I knew everything there was to know about personal training and nutrition, and it's all been kind of downhill since then. <laughs> um, but, but you know, in my career, I was working primarily on metabolic carts. And so I was measuring people's metabolisms to understand not only how many calories people were burning or how they're, you know, they were burning different calories at different heart rate zones. We were also testing people for their substrate utilization, meaning, you know, could, were people burning more fat or more carbohydrates during exercise or just during their normal day-to-day -day life? And over the course of several years and measuring many people's metabolism, thousands over the years, and then also moving on to training other personal trainers, how to use those machines and how to interpret the data. Um, you know, we started to notice a lot of patterns. Um, we noticed right off the bat that if people did what we kind of gave them as like the standard, a calorie depleted diet. And we gave them an exercise program on top of that. What would happen eventually is, you know, the program might be successful in the short term, but over time, the effect of the metabolism lowering, we were seeing that objectively, we were measuring that objectively and noticing that. And so when people say that, you know, just counting calories and reducing your calories and increasing your energy output through exercise, when they say that doesn't work, like we, we, yeah, we can objectively say that was absolutely the case. And so, you know, we learned to recognize it too like you could see the the female that would walk up the stairs to do one of these assessments and you know she was freezing cold even if it was the middle of summer you know you, they, they, the skin might not be ideal or they might have some hair loss or autoimmune issues and you could just tell like this this human has been dieting or exercising too hard for a really long time so through the course of that um you know we understood that that diets really weren't working very well um but we also started to understand that when people started to reduce their carbohydrate intake and increase the amount of fat that they were eating, their fat oxidation rates would go up, not only during exercise, but also in their day-to-day -day lives. And we were able to measure that. And it was really quite wonderful because, for example, if you were an endurance athlete, when you only store just such a very small amount of carbohydrate, and you know, endurance athletes are told they need to eat a high carbohydrate diet, and they need to carbo load the day before an event to try to top off, again, that very small amount of carbohydrate hydrates that people can store, they would, they would learn that they would bonk during, you know, a half marathon or a marathon, you just run out of energy. So if we can swap that around and help somebody not burn so many of the carbohydrates, but, you know, rely on the reserve of fat, which we have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of calories of storage for that endurance athletes would just perform better. They would do their races and, and they would be able to go much further, much longer. And we were able to do that not only by fixing people's training and make sure that people were not overtraining, but also really very impactfully through nutrition. And again, that was originally through introducing more fat into the diet and starting to reduce the amount of carbohydrates in people's diets. And so over time, I ended up adopting that same thing. And I absolutely noticed the benefit. My stomach would hurt less when I would do my cycling. Um, you know, I, I didn't have to refuel nearly as much. I could go on longer rides and push pretty good and know that I was burning a lot of fat. And that fat came from my stored body fat. So that was kind of the first step of my journey to eventually becoming carnivore. And then as part of the, the gym that we were working at, we were, um, I wouldn't say forced, but the, the gym offered a weight loss program that was called the 60 day challenge. And it was a two month temporary weight loss challenge where somebody signs up, we give them a big packet of a lot of different recipes, ingredients, shopping lists, um, exercises that they could do. Um, it would come with events that they would do like every Tuesday would be maybe a step class or kettlebell class or something involved with that. And then at the end of the 60 days, the people that stepped on the scale to get started to measure their not only starting weight, but also their body fat percentage, they would stand on the scale at the end of the 60 days to see what the changes were. And, you know, after doing so many of them, we would run this once a quarter. So for years we did them and it, the, the, the compliance rate was just atrocious. It was somewhere around 15%, 15% of people, one five, one fifteen 15% of people would start the contest and even stand on the scale, regardless of whether they were successful or not to get out of the contest. And so it, by and large, the program was not successful. It was just it, people were making tons of meals and all these snacks and meal prepping and going out and shopping for exotic ingredients. I'll never forget the one night one of my clients called me crying in the grocery store because she couldn't find arrowroot powder. 
And I didn't know what to tell her. I like, I don't, I don't use error root powder. I don't know what that is either. Like, I'm sorry. So it was really complicated. And, and the problem for us was it, not only was it frustrating to see people fail, but as, as personal trainers who worked for that company, we had to continue to sign more people up. A new challenge would start 30 days after the last one ended. And so if you weren't trying to, you know, help your people in the current challenge, you had to recruit new people to do the next one, which again, would just fail and fail and fail. So um, it was a few years ago, this is probably in 2018, where we had somebody sign up for the challenge. They really were just having no fat in their diet. They had about 25, 30 pounds to lose. I heard in a consultation when we started the contest, like, okay, what are you eating? And he was the kind of person that was like waking up in the middle of the night to eat cereal, very, very hungry, really not satiated. And so, you know, I just said, look, man, let's, let's get some fat in your diet. Let's at least kind of mellow that out a little bit and see if we can't get on top of these sugar cravings. And so he went away and came back a few days later and said, hey, I've lost a pound and a half already and I feel really good. What is this keto stuff? And I was like, well, that that's amazing. Um, good results so far, for sure. You probably lost um, a lot of other things besides just fat in that time, but I don't know what this keto thing is. Let's, let's check it out. And so that really sent me down the rabbit hole as far as learning what a ketogenic diet was. This, um, client ended up losing all the weight he needed to lose in this contest. He won. We got a lot of accolades for, you know, helping somebody win this contest and it was quite successful. And when we finished that contest, my wife and I, who worked for the same company, you know, we were thinking about the next contest that was coming around and how the program we were running was large largely unsuccessful. But if we changed the advice and told people to eat more fat and reduce their carbohydrates, all of a sudden, like it was successful. It worked for this guy. We started introducing it to other people, it worked for them. So my wife and I just said like, why don't we just run our own thing? Why don't we, you know, not tell the company what we're doing? Let's go rogue. Let's find other meal plans that are just higher in fat, have a decent amount of protein and just have a low amount of carbohydrates. And we had tremendous success over the years running that separate program. Our company didn't know what we were doing. Um, I was running free seminars for our group so we could teach people about the science. We could teach them why, you know, their diets and workout programs had failed in the past and why we were doing something different. And we measured and tracked all of the people that we put through that program over the years. And we learned that it was actually not true. The, the first guy that did this, that um, I said he lost not just fat, but other things. We measured everybody's body fat percentage. And when people followed our advice and followed the different meal plans that we were giving them, people were not only losing weight, but they were losing nearly 100% of their weight from fat. And that's uh, over 100 people that we measured over the course of doing this several times. I think it was six times we tracked everybody until the pandemic kind of shut everything down. And it was fantastic. And it gave us really great job satisfaction. We always had, always had somebody win the contest. Um, and we kind of got famous for that. And it was through my studies of low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets that I was first introduced to the carnivore diet through Dr. Sean Baker's appearance on the Joe Rogan podcast. And I listened to the podcast. Um, I was listening to a 55 year old doctor doing just deadlifts and indoor rowing. And all he was doing was eating ribeyes and he was jacked out of his mind and felt amazing, never eating vegetables. And he also mentioned in the podcast that he didn't really rely on blood work. And we were using blood work with our clients at the time to help kind of assess what was going on. And I just thought the whole concept was so preposterous. I turned it off in the middle of the interview. And it wasn't until like really late last year that I I even went back and listened to the rest of the podcast, which is funny because I've been a coach for Dr. Baker on the Rivero site now for about three years. So kind of ironic, but, um, you know, it was, it was over time kind of accepting the message that, you know, maybe plants are really not that good for you. Maybe they're not even like neutral. Maybe they could actively be bad for you. And if meat has everything you need and plants don't really have anything that you need and could be harmful, what's the harm? And so it was April of 2019 that I decided to try my first 30 days on a carnivore diet. And I... I just, you know, coming from a place of already being low carbohydrate, it wasn't that difficult for me to further eliminate things like vegetables or any grains that I had in my diet, which wasn't many, but still enough. And I, within a week or two, I couldn't believe how much better I felt. Um, I lost 10 pounds of fat that I really didn't think I had laying around. It just kind of evaporated. Um, my brain energy was just so much better and to feel fully satiated and just not really have a constant nagging of hunger was really amazing. And I would say more so than anything, my my brain and my connection and my presence just changed in the course of a few weeks and really stressful things that would happen that would really bother me and make me really upset and would ruin my day 
they just kind of slipped away. And my anxiety that I didn't know that I had, always spinning in my head, worrying about the future, it just quieted down. And that for me has been the absolute most wonderful part about the carnivore diet. And so when my 30 day experiment ended, I didn't really ever go back to eating plants. And I've had varying levels of strictness um, through my carnivore journey. I would say now I'm fairly strict on carnivore because for me, if nothing else, like I just don't like feeling anxious. It's easy for me to eat um, a heavy amount of meat and eggs. And I really feel great and optimal when I do that. I have good energy. I can deal with my clients in very long days and go from one to the next to the next without hunger, without any dips in energy or mood. My memory is really good. And I feel better than ever at age 39. And I have no intention of stopping. So that was my long-winded answer to my journey into carnivory. And it's nice to be in a place where I don't feel like I'm ever really going to deviate too much from what I'm currently doing. It's pretty nice. Well, yeah, but what a fabulous answer. And that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Because um, when I was kindly invited onto your podcast, I realized our backgrounds are very similar because I was a high carb uh advocate as a personal trainer and seeing abysmal results absolutely abysmal and since i've been coaching people on carnivore those results and i'm not exaggerating are about 20 times better so i used to celebrate if someone lost seven pounds and now i have people that will lose 70 pounds 140 pounds i mean it, it's there's an, it, there's no comparison and what i particularly like is you were doing lots of measurements you were really taking the data as well so you you factually have proof that eat less, move more was not working or conversely that higher fat does. So yeah, I take my hat off to that brilliant, excellent answer. So um, have you taken this? I know you said about Sean Baker, not having the bloods as part of his regime. Are you still doing these tests when you have co uh, coaching clients? I am not. We were part of a very big corporate gym that had the resources to be able to do that. Um, even I was doing very simple blood tests. So um, for a while, I was doing finger sticks that would give people lipid panels so we could show them what their cholesterol levels were like. And yeah, it was it was nice. It was really nice to have that data. It was nice to use the metabolic hearts, which we no longer have access to, um, to be able to show people exactly what they needed to do to increase their fat burning if that was their goal or how to lose extra fat or increase their metabolic rates if that was their goal. It was nice. It was nice to have that equipment. That said, um, I find that a lot of the really technical measurements are just really snapshots and they can give you a nice view of something that's going on in that moment. It's just a little bit harder to try to extrapolate that out to the rest of a day or a week or a year. Um, and, and also I noticed that even when we had the data and had things to show people, it wouldn't change the advice. My advice would be about the same anyway. Like people are eating too many carbohydrates they're not getting a decent amount of protein and fat. They're told that animal products are bad for them and is going to clog their heart and, and cause all kinds of different problems. They're, people are being lied to all the time. And so my advice was not changing for people. And so when we lost access to those things as we were unemployed during the pandemic, we started our own company. We don't, we don't use those tools anymore. We do have a body fat scale that we use just to help validate that people are losing fat, um, which is nice. But at the end of the day, I love the way that Sean Baker says it. He says, you know what? My best indication for health and longevity is how do you feel today? If you feel good today, that is a really good indication. You're probably going to feel good tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. And again, when I first heard that concept, I thought it was a little bit nuts. But the longer I do this, the more I think I, he's really onto something. And I really value that approach but that said, if somebody has access to blood testing, if they have access to metabolic testing, the more information we have, the better. I'm not going to argue against anybody using any particular method, but I also think it's empowering to know that if you don't have access to those things, you can still be very effective as long as you're following the right advice and not listening to the people out there that are sharing wrong advice, mostly for profit. Yes. And it's interesting that you were part of a big corporate gym and you had a lot of success. Did that not make them prick up their ears and think, oh, maybe we're on something here to, to put us ahead? No, were they, no, no, absolutely. No, no. We had 140 locations around the country. Um, and yeah, we were, we were in a unique area for the company because the company only has one gym in my state. So we, we, we get largely ignored 
around here. Um, there's other states that have 20 or 30 different clubs in them. And so they get a lot more attention and press and that kind of thing. And no, they, I would say by and large, they didn't care in my own club. People started calling me keto Casey and they were like pigeonholing me into low carbohydrate. People knew that's what I did. And that's what I was coaching. And, you know, at first I really didn't like that. I wanted to be able to help anybody with their nutritional journey, regardless of whether they were doing low carbohydrate or whether they're vegetarian or vegan. And I'm really grateful that I got the advice um, early on from my business mentor who just said, look, you should probably embrace what you're doing. Like you should just kind of accept that you know more about this than anybody else around here. And people are going to come to you for the right reasons. And I ended up embracing that. And my goal and my passion and drive is similar to yours. I'm never going to know you know, the most about this stuff, but I'm also never going to stop trying. I'm going to continue learning and refining and practicing and learning and continue to be wrong about stuff all the time because I want to continue pushing down that way. I know you share that same passion and drive and I would call it an obsession. It's really a fun thing to get obsessed about. And at the end of the day, it's my life. It's my livelihood. It's my presence on the planet. It's my ability to help my clients improve their lives and show up for their kids and their grandkids. And when you can, when you can shift somebody's entire life for the better, it's so addictive. It's amazing. And it makes me get up out of bed at five in the morning, every single day without an alarm clock and be so excited for my day. It was so different. Like, like you mentioned, like when you're training and you're giving people terrible advice and it's not working and all you can think of is to say, oh, well, you didn't eat enough vegetables. You should have meal planned better. Why didn't you journal about your feelings during mealtime? You just turn around and blame these poor people for not being good enough. So everybody feels like a failure. It sucks. It really sucks. And I did it for years. And to find something different and to see a totally different paradigm shift and all of these happy people getting results, it's incredible. It is incredible. And, and it's just so... I mean, I go to I go to sleep every night absolutely satisfied that I've helped someone. I mean, I did a coaching call just before this interview, you know, and she said your advice was a game changer. And it's just uh, those little things. See, I can see it in your face. You see, people people listening on the podcast, you can't see that. You know, Casey's reaction is exactly my reaction when he tells me things. Um, I would say uh, I one of the things I am qualified in is phlebotomy, and I and I would have to say. I keep learning. I love learning. I've been doing this a long time, since thousands of data points. But only in the last week, it's something I've been working on. I've I've looked at a couple of panels and, and we've worked out, or I've worked out, how we can see if someone's fat adapted from their blood. And also only yesterday, with quite an extensive panel, quite nuanced, which you can't buy, by the way. You'd have to, you'd have to speak to me about what we did. But we looked at somebody that was thinking they had oxalate problems, oxalate uh, malabsorption, and the bloods pretty much prove it. And then we submitted it to the labs and the labs came back and said, yeah, that's, that does show that. So wow, I think I, I love learning. I'm 58. I love learning. You know, this couple of months I'll be 59 and I feel I've learned more on carnivore and think it's because we're open minded, actually, because the, the big corporate reaction was, yeah, so what? We don't care because we're making money. This is a profitable model. This is what the mainstream want. We don't really care about health. They don't, they don't sadly. I mean, they just care about the bottom line. Whereas that's I think true. in carnivore, we want to help people. And that's, that's the main thing. So um, I normally ask this the other way around, but I just wanted to talk about your past because it's fascinating. So I, I tend to ask this question first, really about your meal. So what are you doing? How, is it two meals a day? Do you fast? What, what do you do? So for me personally, I did OMAD for quite a long time. Um, I was doing pretty much exclusively ribeye steaks when I was first starting on carnivore. I was able to find some inexpensive ribeye steaks. And so I, I was able to pull that off. Otherwise, that would have been cost prohibitive for sure. Um, I, I did that for a long time. Um, I have since kind of opened up my diet and done different things other than ribeyes. Um, and, and I did OMAD for quite a long time. I believe that I overdid OMAD. And I think I must have struggled with getting in enough calories in my one meal a day because I was noticing some of the effects that I would notice when I was running metabolic tests on people if they had a lowered metabolic rate. So energy was a little bit low. I was definitely feeling cold in my hands and my feet. Um, wasn't able to hold on to muscle as well as I wanted to. And through that, I, I recognized that, okay, I'm, I might be having a metabolic lowering effect here. So since understanding that, uh, the, I, mean, I would 
say maybe like a year and a half. I've been doing two meals a day. So typically speaking on a work day when I am not, um, I don't have a lot of time. I'm really busy. I will, you know, basically just have hard boiled eggs on hand and I'll eat somewhere between six and 10 hard boiled eggs, um, somewhere around noon or one, or just whenever I have time. And then later on in the day, when I'm done with my work and my clients, I'm also done with my administrative work for the business. I will really just kind of have whatever sounds good to me. So lately that's been some type of red meat, maybe a pound of tri-tip or some sirloin has been really, really good lately. Maybe I'll do ground beef or beef patties or burgers or meatballs. Um, and lately also fried eggs for whatever reason have been sounding incredible to me. So not only do I do eggs in the morning, but I've been doing some fried eggs cooked in butter um, at the end of the day. And I will just eat that until I am fully, fully satiated. So that's been a nice pattern. I don't normally track my food, but one of my clients last summer asked me to track. And that was a time that I was also including uh, more protein. I was doing some whey protein powder. I was doing some Greek yogurt as well as kind of a snack before bedtime. And I calculated that my normal intake was somewhere around 2,500 calories. I was getting uh, north of 200 calories of protein um, right around there for the same number of grams of fat in a day, maybe around 150 to 200. And that that's about where I am today. And that's worked out really well for me. Um, if it's the weekend and I've got a little bit more time, um, this last year, I got really, really obsessed with formula one as well. And so on Saturday mornings, I call them my quali eggs. So as I'm watching qualifying on formula one on my phone, I will take, um, a big old stick of butter, put it in a frying pan. I'll crack anywhere from 16 to 22 eggs and just stir it around until it gets that nice scrambled buttery, lovely texture. And I'll just throw that on a plate and eat that as I'm watching, uh, quali and F1. So that's, that's what I do on the weekends when I have a little bit more time. Great answer. Thank you. Um, I think it's one of the interesting things as well, that in this space, we talk about under eating. And that's a big factor and a big change. I think, you know, it, I love talking to you because it brings it all back to me when I was a personal trainer. We'd never talk about under eating. We would always talk about eat less, eat less. And you, you nailed it. I mean, then your metabolic rate just slows down. You feel cold, you feel sluggish and you feel hungry. So I think <laughs> it's such a failed paradigm. It's, it's, it's very nice the way you put it into words there. Um, you mentioned protein powder. Is that something that is part of your regime or is that something? It, great question. It is occasional. I don't do it all the time. I don't love a lot of supplements. Um, if I am, if I'm in a period of time when I'm actively trying to build muscle rather than just maintain muscle, I, I will have more of it, but it's like, it's a scoop a day, maybe in some Greek yogurt. So it makes like this chocolatey kind of yogurt mix. I don't, I don't do it all the time. In fact, I haven't done it in probably several months. Um, I think when my activity level goes up, I tend to do it more. So in the summertime, when it's warm, I'm riding my bike in between my clients, I'm getting a little bit more activity. I feel like my natural hunger for that um, kind of comes up and, um, and I will just tend to have that more. And that's just another nice thing about carnivore is that, you know, people talk about intuitive eating and we should be eating intuitively. And if I'm, if I'm on a standard American diet, I will intuitively eat a sleeve of Oreos and a pint of ice cream, an entire pie. And I'll do that intuitively, right? Like that, that does not work, but when you reset yourself and you so you start to go carnivore, you actually, I believe, can eat very intuitively. And if you listen to the signals that your body is telling you, does red meat sound good? Does chicken sound good? Does bacon sound good? Does sausage sound good? If you pay attention to that, even to the point of like, like organ meats, I would say, not something I always include, but sometimes they sound really good to me. I think that's a great way to eat really intuitively. And so I try not to force anything that I'm not actively craving at the time. So yeah, so protein powder, I don't do consistently, but if I feel the need for it, I will use that from time to time. And is that whey protein that you tend to use? It, it yeah. is whey protein. And I've, man, I, it's so hard to know the quote unquote quality of the protein. The kind I was getting and using fairly regularly was I would say fairly inexpensive from Costco. I never really saw anything that said it was good quality or bad quality. It seemed to work for the purpose that I needed it for. So, you know, what, what kind people get, I, I'm, I wouldn't be the person to ask, but I felt, I felt fine on it. And if I feel like I need to include it or increase it, I, I will. And that moves me nicely onto training because 
you mentioned your bike. So, so what is your weekly training regime? What do you do? Yeah. So if uh, walking is my favorite activity and I'm really grateful for the pandemic in that way right, to increase, um, you know, walking when everybody felt like they were locked in, we felt around here that we were free to go on walks and spend lots of time outside, which is wonderful. So I, I try to get anywhere from 10 to 20,000 steps a day. As far as walking goes, I will play ice hockey once a week on Wednesday mornings. So I did that this morning, which is great. Um, I do cycle around in the summertime when it's warm in between clients. So that could be a ride of five miles or it could be a ride of 20 miles. If it's a weekend and I have more time, I'll go out and ride two or three hours. That's just for fun. And I keep my heart rate low. So I know that's a really fat burning type of activity for me. Other than that, I really very much prioritize resistance training and I will do strength training. If that's going to my community center and lifting weights on machines, I'll do that. If that is taking my TRX out to the lake by my house and hooking it up to a tree or a set of monkey bars, that's great. Recently, I've been playing more with thicker resistance bands, similar to what you might find on an X3 bar or a Harambe system. And I have very much enjoyed using resistance bands as the progress as the resistance is progressive. When you're pulling a, a heavy band, it's actually getting heavier the more you're pulling it. And so it's working with you and getting lighter as you're deloading it to keep a really constant tension in the muscle fiber. And I've found that I can maintain and build muscle quite easily and, and not have to do that very frequently. And I've really enjoyed that. So I might do some deadlifts or some rows or some chest presses, a lot of compound lifts, shoulder presses, lat pull downs, maybe some squats or lunges. And, you know, I do that for maybe an hour a week, just whenever I have time and when it, when it sounds good. I, but generally I try to stay active and try to stay outside as much as possible. So that's pretty much my training routine with my clients and the way that I train them. We'll use whatever equipment they have, but I will put a very high priority on resistance training and using whatever equipment they have. We try to get them to progressive resistance where they're getting near failure on every set so that they can get stronger or build muscle the way that they like. I just think it's so important as we age to really focus on muscle and make that um, a high priority. So when it comes to clients, do you try, if they've come to you for personal training, do you also talk about nutrition? Whoever is open to talking about nutrition, absolutely. Um, I have one client who told me early on that he was, he was good with his nutrition. He was doing a plant-based diet and he, he didn't want to hear anything about nutrition. I gave him my opinion one time and I let it lie. And I told him like, look, you can listen or not. And that's fine. I'm just going to tell you this. If you ever have questions, let me know. I'm a resource for you. And you know what? We're, we're doing training once a week and he's, he's, <laughs> he's not seeing great results. He's kind of going a little bit backwards. He's adding body fat. Um, over time, even though we're training, his energy is not great. He's on medications. He's in his thirties to be on a statin and a hypertensive medication already on your thirties is, I mean, that sucks. That's not ideal. I, I wouldn't want that. And to have the knowledge and understanding that I do that, like, man, if, if you were working with the right practitioner and you were getting the right advice, we could deep prescribe you some of this stuff that has a lot of side effects. He's not open to it, so we don't talk about it. But my other clients, if they're open to it, th then uh, yes, absolutely. We are talking nutrition. I'm counting to 12 for them and designing their programs. But also, as you know, as a trainer, there's lots of time to talk about how their life is going, what things they could do better, what things they're really proud of. And, and nutrition is definitely one of those. So anybody who's open to that will definitely talk to them about it. And if nothing else, just sharing the message that if, if you're, if nothing else, Add some protein, get a little bit more animal protein in your diet. If you're eating a mixed diet, fine, we can address that over time, but people are just so far under the amount of protein that they're, that they're eating that I try to make that the priority with everyone, regardless of how open they are to a carnivore diet. Now, a big question. Sorry to keep asking you big questions. What about fasting? What are your views on fasting? Great question. These are big questions. I love them. Um, I found that you really have to be very clear about what somebody means when they say fasting. For me, fasting is not eating. And maybe, again, it's kind of semantics of what you call it. Um, if it's time-restricted eating or fasting, I, I kind of think of time-restricted eating as anything inside of about 24 hours. And fasting maybe is something that's more than 24 hours. Generally speaking, I think for most people, anything that's time-restricted in a 24-hour period seems to be very easy and very safe. And most people can do that. 
I think that when you are eating the proper diet and you're eating a lot of protein and fat, fasting or time restricted eating, it's, there's just not a question. Like right now I have not eaten any calories in what time is it? I haven't eaten anything in 16 hours. Um, I, I played ice hockey this morning. There wasn't very many people that showed up, which means I had to skate really hard and really fast and to get a lot of breaks. And I've already seen clients this morning. I'm doing this interview now and you know, I've had a busy day and I have a, a very active day that started at four 30 and you know, I, I'm not hungry. I don't feel that hungry. I'm not interested in food. It's, it's really interesting when you get to a place of true satiety by eating a carnivore diet it's not, it's not a forced thing to not eat tons of meals. It's just a, like, you're not hungry. So you just go about your day. And when you feel hungry, you should eat. And that's typically what I recommend for my people. Um, I've had a few people try extended fasting and I have to say they've experienced amazing success when they did it. Um, it was really cool to have a client who was doing weekday fast. So he had lots of fat to lose. He needed to lose weight. So he would stop eating on Sunday and he wouldn't eat again until Friday night. So he would go five or six days without any food. And we had sessions on Tuesday morning and Friday mornings. So I saw him literally at the end of his fast. And I recall that Tuesdays he would be hungry. <clears throat> it would be a, the more difficult day for him. You know, not eating for 36 hours was, that was kind of the window that he was really hungry at. When I saw him on Fridays, he was not hungry and he was feeling amazing. And he would do PRs on things like deadlifts. It was really remarkable. And even being bought into fasting as much as I was at the time, it was, it was really cool to like firsthand witness what somebody could do in the fasted state. And it was amazing. He lost lots of weight and he's since given it up and has struggled a little bit with his health, but um, it was cool to see. And so I think it's more challenging to go multi-days. So if you do work with somebody who knows what they're talking about when it comes to long fasting, but I, I recommend anything under 24 hours, I think is just totally fine. And I, I ask my clients to really pay attention to their hunger cues. And if they feel hungry, they can decide whether they want to eat or whether they want to push it out a little bit more. It also depends on somebody's goal. So if somebody has lots of fat and they want to get rid of the fat, I think they're more okay with doing fasting. If somebody's trying to gain muscle or we're concerned about their metabolic rate being a little bit reduced, that's when we say fasting may be not the best tool for them. We want to try to get more doses of protein in during the day and having more meals would be a good way to do that. So it really depends on the person, but in general, I think it's totally safe. And for fat loss, from what I've seen until something can change my mind, I think that is the pinnacle and the gold standard of what can work for most people for fat loss. Mm, no, I agree a hundred percent. You, you said something there that's uh, we won't talk about that particular client, but in general, do you find that um, a small percentage of people get to the goal they want to be at and then give up doing all the right things and fall back? Because you mentioned that one client there, they, they stopped and then the health started to go uh, south again. Great question. It really just depends. That's a really great question. It, it really, to me, comes back to how sick are people of being sick? If somebody is just carrying an extra 10 or 15 pounds, look, carbohydrates and processed foods, they taste amazing. They're really, really, really good. That's how good they are. If people are willing to not feel optimal because this food that's out there in the food system tastes that great. For me, I, I'm not willing to trade in my personal life. I am not willing to trade a really, really amazing good taste for you know, 20 seconds of desire for feeling terrible and feeling anxious. That's enough motivation for me to stay on the strict side of carnivore. So it really just depends on somebody's motivation. For, for this person in particular, he was doing great, going on really great, um, getting really great results. He went on a vacation. He relaxed during the vacation and he never recovered. He reacquired the taste for sweet things and for processed foods and for things like bread. He has to this day has not recovered that and has gone uh, downhill and it sucks. It's hard. And and now to be able to do what he did again, it, it, it's going to be tougher. So, you know, it really, it depends on the person, but the people that succeed and succeed long-term, they know what it's like to go off the diet. They don't feel right. They don't feel well. People don't come to carnivore just for the hell of it. They thought it sounded fun. Like they came because they suffered. They tried to follow advice and it didn't work and their skin sucks or their gut has problems or their mind is not clear, or it could be even more serious things like cancer or really heavy mental disorders like bipolar. And those people it's it's not really a question for them if they're going to stay strict and stay on it they're going to because if they don't they really suffer and so yeah it's 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 
tough and I see both ways all the time and I wish more people would at least try it. And I do wish more people would stick with it because the people that do just, they thrive. They really do. It's really quite amazing. Yeah. So um, when did you set up your business then? What, what made that decision? <laughs> we set up in July of 2020, not, not the most ideal time to start a business, but for us, my wife and I, again, working for the same company, it was really a practical thing. As you know, as a personal trainer, you're a hundred percent commission. We were making 100% commission. And the situation that we had before the pandemic was really good with this company because it was a very high end facility. We had access to lots of equipment and, and, you know, some of the things we talked about earlier, we had great machines and the facility was nice. And again, to do metabolic testing on people was really great. And we were well-respected. We had a good career. We had a lot of following and we had a lot of people coming into the gym and the pandemic just totally turned that on its side. All of a sudden, you know, our clients were not going to that gym. They were staying home. They had acquired new habits and learned that they actually liked working out at home better with a few bands or some weights that they had, or maybe some kettlebells. And they didn't need to get all dressed up and gussied up to go to the gym like they used to. People were not driving to the business complex where that gym was because they were working from home at the time. And so for us, it was really a necessity thing. We still had our same people and they needed workouts during the pandemic. But the only way that we could see moving forward was to start our own business. And so we're not entrepreneurs. We didn't think of ourselves in that way. But through a lot of blood, sweat and tears, we started the company and we learned how to grow and how to do marketing and how to do accounting. And we learned how to do the podcast, which we do now. And it's been a really fun journey and I would definitely never go back. But yeah, it was the the the, I guess the necessity of the situation that made us say like, wow, I guess we're now entrepreneurs and we're going to start our own business and here we go. And we did it and and we've been doing it now for almost three years. It's been wonderful. Well done. I'm really impressed. And, and we had a parallel existence, I think, because that's exactly <laughs> what was happening with me. I used to do yep. rehab as well because I have a lot of uh, <laughs> rehabilitation um, qualifications and 90% of my income uh, went completely gone. Went. Oh, oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah, just wow. because of the restrictions, which yeah, I'm not going to get into anyway. Right. So that was brilliant. So I tend to do short, sharp interviews, uh, but I think uh, because we've just mentioned that, uh, I rarely do this. But if you want to tell me about the places people can find you, uh, it will be in the description. I will, it will be on the screen. But if you just want to give me a quick run through the ways people can see you, meet you, talk to you, listen to you, it would be great. Yeah, of course. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. This has been a really fun conversation. I always enjoy talking to you. And I, I, I agree. We have very similar paths and have had similar challenges. And I, I, I can speak for myself. And I think you would agree with some of the challenges that we faced trying to do what we do on a standard American diet would be nearly impossible to do it on a carnivore diet and to feel so much energy and drive and passion really is the only way we could keep this thing going. So it, it's been a wonderful journey. The easiest place is just one place, which is our website, which is myboundlessbody.com. From there, they can find the podcast. They can find our social medias and they can follow us there if they like. The biggest thing I want people to know is one of the first things you'll see on the website is a book now button. And that will take you to a page to be able to set up a complimentary 30 minute call. We offer that for anybody around the world. And I have people all the time to take us up on that. Uh, just the other the day, I talked to two people in your neighborhood in England and one person in Australia, which is really fun. And that is free. And we offer that to anybody and we can talk about anything, whether it's fitness or nutrition or carnivore diets. We could talk about other lifestyle factors like stress and sleep. Oftentimes, you know, people have questions, but they also already have a good idea of a plan of what they want to do. And they really just need validation. They just want somebody to say, you know what, I've got experience doing this. I think what you're doing is going to work great. Go ahead and do it. And I think that can help a lot of people. So again, to be able to find us, that is my boundlessbody.com if you want to see more of this type of thing or that type of thing then just check out this video this one just just click it you can subscribe if you want but this video is really good